I'd like to introduce to you uh, Rick Anthes, who's a former student here, uh, going way back into uh, 1962 when he was an undergraduate student from out of state, I believe. Is that right? You came from Virginia. And then he uh, went on with to a master's degree and a PhD. His talk today is going to be more of a general topic, just about philosophy and modeling and what we can do with weather prediction overall, called Demons and Butterflies. So here's Rick. So without further ado, and you'll see why in a minute, I'm going to get started and um, with a uh, prologue. Actually, more than half of the slides are not even directly related to my talk. <laughs> This is kind of interesting. The prologue is very long, and the uh, <clears throat> title of the prologue is Sandy, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, a Photographic Essay. And I hope this is relevant from a societal point of view about what the, uh, what the real talk is going to be about. So hurricanes, I've seen many pictures. They're absolutely beautiful from space just majestic, it's artistic almost. Uh, they're just uh, just amazing to see. And so many people, this is one of the reasons I got interested in hurricanes, because from a distance they're just uh, wonderful. But when you actually experience one, it's anything but, but beautiful. Hell on earth. And I'll start out with uh, Sandy. This is a, a split image of New York City on a typical night at top. And the night after Sandy hit, uh, in the in the lower half, where almost all of the city is uh, without power. So now I won't say anything for the next uh, hundred slides or so. Thank you. 
And then I'm trying to in inject a tiny bit of humor at the end of this. That there's Hurricane Nate where the chief damage was uh, blowing a bunch of pumpkins out of a field. Uh, but anyway, these are, these are uh, picture stories that I don't think I get from the news. Uh, you just don't, you know, you hear 27 deaths and a billion dollars of damage and this kind of thing. It just doesn't, uh, until you see the variety of people who are affected by these things and the amount of time it takes to rebuild their lives. So, um, so what, what about Hurricane Sandy? And I was inspired to do this talk right after Sandy, which is 2012. Um, it's formed in the Western Caribbean late in the year, October 22nd, almost uh, this time of year. Made landfall in New Jersey on October 29th, very late. The largest Atlantic hurricane on record. And these are the statistics. They just don't tell the story you saw. 53 people killed, $32 billion in damage. Uh, which was about one third of the government sequester at that point. So, how good were the forecasts of Hurricane Sandy? They were superb. They were excellent. They were unbelievable. And it wasn't by chance. How many more lives would have been lost without these excellent forecasts? You saw the damage that was done. It's a remarkable thing that only 53 people were killed. Probably thousands would have been killed if that storm had come in unannounced. Can't imagine if people weren't prepared for it, what the, what the uh, loss of life would be. Never before had a hurricane approached the East Coast from the East in late October. Came in from the East. Never before. Here is a set of tracks, the historical tracks, of hurricanes that came within 200 nautical miles of New York City um, in, from 1851 to 2011, the entire record up until 2012. You see, every one of those tracks, by the time the uh, storm hit, uh, you know, past the Virginia Capes, was heading off to the north and northeast. The uh, Hurricane uh, Sandy came up the coast and if you were a forecaster who had no satellite observations or, or models and you, and you saw that track, you would have, everybody would have forecast continued movement out to sea. Instead, it did something that no storm had ever done before. It turned to the left and came in and made landfall uh, from the east. Never, ever before happening, and yet it was well predicted. How can that be? Here's a forecast from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, nine and a half days before landfall. And on the left, you can see that their outlook, nearly 10 days before landfall, had this, um, this gray, uh, grayish area uh, out saw off the uh, Atlantic coast, where the, um, already uh, they were forecasting, some of their models were forecasting a major event, significant probability of a severe windstorm affecting the northeastern United States. Then by the time, three days later, six and a half days before landfall, the various models were forecasting those tracks that you see uh, in the middle panel. And already, almost a week before landfall, this, they were, the models were forecasting this left turn, which again had never happened before. So this is not an empirical model or based on past data. It is a, a model based on laws of physics and mathematics and observations. And then the observed track is shown off to the uh, on the right panel. So extremely well forecast. People had a, uh, many days of warnings and were well prepared. Well, this was not, this was, you know, a lot of people say, well, we got through that disaster. It'll never happen again in my lifetime. And, uh, you know, it can't happen to me again. Well, this is this year. Jump forward nine years to 2017, or five years, I guess it is. Uh, through September, there had been 15 separate $1 billion weather and climate disasters just through September. So we're on a track for a record year. And you see they're all over the country. There's hurricanes, there's tornado outbreaks, there's fires, um, uh, all kinds of things. And uh, it's just no question, this is not just anecdotal, it's no question that the frequency of severe uh, weather and climate events is getting is getting uh, higher. 
And why is that? Well, this is not a talk on global warming, but it is global warming, stupid. And that's all I'll say about that. So the lecture is demons and butterflies, but I'm trying to set the context uh, for, uh, for something that's important. What is this? It's a fortune teller. It's a wizard. Somebody that tells the future. Amazing, people believe, would believe this guy before they'd believe science. But foretelling the future has always been a fascination of humanity. And prophets over the ages have been worshipped and vilified. It's said that, you've always heard this joke, I'm sure as meteorologists, that weather forecasters are the second oldest profession in the world. People want to know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so foretelling the future has always been a fascination, whether it's forecasting the stock market or forecasting the football game results or whatever it is. People love to talk about forecasting the future. And you see it in these common expressions, I should have known, I should have seen it coming. In retrospect, it was obvious. 2020 hindsight. Signs were there for all to see. Sixth sense. Premonition. And in today already walks tomorrow. The present is big with the future. Good detectives such as Sherlock Holmes and Hercule Poirot deduce what has happened and sometimes what will happen from a few observations. For telling the future can be based on past behavior, empiricism, or the natural laws of mathematics, physics, and chemistry. But all predictions, one way or another, based, are based on observations. Whether you're a, a, a fortune teller or a, a mathematical model, modeler of uh, hurricanes, you're, uh, you're using observations one way or another. Well, the theory, the ph philosophy of forecasts and, and goes back many years, and uh, Gottfried Leibniz, famous for Leibniz's rule in mathematics, if you, if you know that, I think we all learned that in our calculus courses, 1646 to 1716, a very interesting <clears throat> quote, everything proceeds mathematically. If someone could have sufficient insight into the inner parts of things, and in addition had remembrance and intelligence enough to consider all of the circumstances and take them into account. He would be a prophet and see the future in the present as in a mirror. So read that carefully. You have to have insight, remembrance, intelligence, and to consider everything. This is foreseeing models in a way, very complex systems. Where if you could understand everything, you could predict everything. And even more direct, the Marquis de Laplace, you know about Laplacians, right? Laplace in mathematics, he's a mathematician. He dreamed of an intelligent being, an intellect, which was later dubbed, I guess by his colleagues, Laplace's demon, who knew the positions. He dreamed of an intelligent being who knew the positions and, and velocities of every single atom in the universe. And using Newton's equations of motion, he could predict the motion of each one of these atoms, all the molecules that the atoms were part of. They didn't know about smaller subatomic, subatomic atoms at that time, but predict the future of the entire universe. And uh, this uh, long quote at the end is actually very prescient in terms of, uh, of how you, uh, the, the theory behind developing numerical weather prediction models. We may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. An intellect which at any given moment knew all the forces that animate nature and the mutual positions of the beings that compose it. If this intellect, think supercomputer, were vast enough to submit the data to analysis, could condense into a single formula the movement of the greatest bodies of the universe and that of the lightest atom. For such an intellect, nothing could be uncertain, 
and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. So the condition of every one of us in the room, every molecule, every wave out there, and, and all around the world, including the molecules in, in life itself, if you knew exactly where they were today, according to Laplace, you could predict uh, everything in the future, how humans would behave, when they would die, when they, how many children they would have, how many children the children would have, and so on and so on. Perfectly deterministic system if you knew where everything was and you knew all of the laws that would follow. That was Laplace's view. And then Niels Bohr, the famous physicist, had a much simpler statement, uh, which sounds to me like Yogi Berra, <laughs> more like Yogi Berra than Niels Bohr, but uh, prediction is difficult, especially the future. True, well, I think we can all agree with that, uh, even though we may question Laplace's demon a little bit. Well, Bjergnes, Wilhelm Bjergnes, getting into our field in 1904, uh, the father of the Norwegian School of uh, Weather Prediction, um, uh, said the following, if it's true as any scientists believe that subsequent status states of the atmosphere develop from preceding ones according to physical laws, one will agree that the necessary and sufficient conditions for a rational solution of the problem of meteorological prediction are the following. Number one, one has to know with sufficient accuracy the state of the atmosphere at a given time. Those are the observations. Then one has to know with sufficient accuracy the laws according to which one state of the atmosphere develops from another. That's the mathematics and physics of how motion reacts to uh, forces um, <clears throat> at, a given, at a given time. And this is, definitely the, this is definitely the basis for numerical weather prediction. <clears throat> well, then some 50 years later, along comes a uh, brilliant mathematician, actually a meteorologist who uh, became brilliant in the field of mathematics, one of the few ones that ever did this, Ed Lorenz from MIT, uh, got into chaos theory and um, is alleged to have said, uh, 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 at least interpreted to have said, does the flap of a butterfly's wing in, tor in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? And this is now in popular mythology and popular speeches as the butterfly effect. And it's the idea that uh, you can never measure everything to a sufficient accuracy to make a, a good prediction, a perfect prediction. There's always going to be a butterfly somewhere that you don't know, you can't follow, and the butterfly flaps its wings and, and that sets off a cascade of events that lead to something uh, as severe as a tornado in Texas or a hurricane in New Jersey. Um, in, the, uh, in the 70s, Greg was talking about uh, why I was developing numerical models and uh, you have the so-called mesoscale. And a lot of the larger scale dynamicists said that you're wasting your time because uh, the smaller scales of motion are never going to be predictable. And why are you just trying to do mesoscale models? But uh, so I was trying to think of a rebuttal to this and I came up with this I the idea that in many synoptic situations, large scale situations, the small scales are forced by the larger scales. So if you know the large scale waves, uh, they produce fronts in more or less the right place, smaller scale events. They produce areas of favorable for convection and so forth. And so that uh, if you know the large scale initial conditions and you can predict them, they will lead to small scale uh, phenomena, uh, create small scale phenomena even before the small scale phenomena exist. And so you actually see that today. People are forecasting tornado outbreaks uh, three or four days before uh, tornadoes actually occur, uh, even start to occur, because the large scale is predicted well and it predicts the environment of, 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 uh, of tornadoes. So uh, that was my argument for the uh, fact that there was predictability in the uh, smaller scales of motion, which according to predictability theory should be less predictable than uh, for the very large scales. Anyway, if we look at uh, some real data in this case, this is, these are uh, forecast accuracies of the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, ECMWF, since 1981 has had the best global prediction model in the world. And the United States has tried desperately to catch up to this model, but has always lagged behind it by about a, a half a day's worth of forecast. What this shows is the um, 
Uh, you don't need to understand what the skill scores are, but 100 is at the top would be a perfect forecast, and uh, 30 would be a, like a correlation coefficient of 30, wouldn't be much value, but still some value over guessing. And the uh, colors are different uh, links to the forecast. So the, uh, the, the blue envelope is, I guess, uh, day three forecast. So the day three forecast tend to be very accurate, and they've been increasing in accuracy with time, uh, going from about 87% in, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere in 1981 to uh, nearly 96% uh, in recent years, and they've leveled off. They have uh, uh, aren't getting much better because the, apparently the, the three-day forecast is close to as good as it's ever going to get. The lower part of that green envelope at the top is the Southern Hemisphere forecast, and you can see that it was much worse in 1981 than the than the Northern Hemisphere. And why is that? It's because Southern Hemisphere doesn't have as much data, doesn't have as much, uh, a lot more air oceans and then they don't have as many balloons and so forth. But that gap is closed until today it's almost non-existent and that's because of satellites. Satellites are global, they measure globally and so the Southern Hemisphere gets just as good observations as the Northern Hemisphere now. And this is a dramatic testament to the power of global satellites of which Wisconsin, of course, is one of the leaders, is the, is the leader in the world in, uh, in satellite meteorology. Uh, the red curves are like five-day forecasts, and the green curves are seven days or whatever, it doesn't matter. But the forecasts are getting better at all time scales, and uh, the gap between the northern hemisphere at the, the top of each of the bands and the southern hemisphere is diminishing because of global observations. Absolute truth, positive truth of the impact of uh, global models and uh, satellite, uh, satellite observations. So one of the other ones, the reasons I'm bringing up the resolution of these global models uh, one at a time, roughly at the, at the same time scale as the uh, bottom. So in 1981, the European Center model had a horizontal spacing between data points of about 200 kilometers, 100 some miles. And, and what you're seeing here is the resolution getting finer and finer, the pixel size getting smaller and smaller, the models resolving finer and finer scales. And that's a picture of a hurricane. When it gets down to uh, 16 kilometers, and the last one is, um, is 10 kilometers, you can actually see, see Hurricane Katrina. But that's what Hurricane Katrina looks like at 250 kilometers on the far left. It's just a blur, a smudge. So you can't even resolve hurricanes back in 1981 with these models, but by, uh, by currently you can. And that's a testament to the uh, value of, of uh, computer power and uh, good models in addition to the good observations. So the predictions are getting better all the time. The next slide <coughs> shows a different way of judging how good models are. This goes back to, uh, to 19, uh, 2008. Uh, 2008 technology of, of geostationary satellites. It's the uh, Meteosat observations. And on the, if, you, if I didn't have these things labeled, even in 2008, you have trouble telling which is the model and which is the satellite if you didn't have these labeled, right? And you could probably tell if you stared at it long enough if you're an expert if you're either an expert in the models or in the, in the geostationary satellite imagery. But just looking at it, the casual person is going to say, that model on the right is damn good, even without looking at numbers. You can, you, and so you know the model is doing something right. And we were looking at, uh, at uh, one of the uh, uh, tornado models this, this morning, this afternoon. And the tornado model of the clouds were so so accurate, you just know that they're right, even without a lot of numbers. So this is actually one way of verifying models, is to look at uh, pattern recognition. Humans are very good at, at seeing whether something looks good or not, looks right or not, and you can see it there. And that was uh, quite a few years ago. The the, the models in the uh, geostationary satellites that like GOES, uh, GOES R, what's it called now, GOES 16? GOES, uh, yeah, is uh, much better models, and much better uh, resolution on the satellites and much better resolution on the models. So they still look uh, very good together. Uh, but numbers are important. <clears throat> Here's a, a record of um, hurricane, official hurricane 
track errors over time from 1970, before models and before satellites, uh, out to 2016, the latest uh, data I had from the National Hurricane Center. And the track errors are in, um, in nautical miles, which are very close to miles, from zero to, uh, to 700. In this case, a low number is good because the track error, the error, the position error of the storm is smaller. And so you can see that the different forecast, the red curve is 24 hours, the green is 48 hours, and so on up to 120 hours, the dark blue at the top. <clears throat> with, uh, with some year-to-year -year variation, all of these official forecasts are, are getting better. And they're starting to uh, maybe converge. Of course, you can't get any better than zero, so at least the uh, one-day, the two-day, and the three-day forecast are getting, getting pretty darn good to less than 50 miles 50 mile error uh, in position of the storm. So anecdotally, the forecasts are getting better, like uh, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, statistically, they're getting better. We know why. It's computers, it's models, it's satellite observations of all kinds, it's better physics, it's scientists working on this. This is not an accident. It's not because of political philosophy or, uh, you know, the people are better or anything like that. It's pure science, physics, measurements, education. What, this is all something that we did, we as a community, as a, as a university community, as, a, as government centers in Europe and in the United States. These are, we did this. This is not foregone. This is not an accident. It's, it's, it's the results of mathematicians and physicists and chemists and computer scientists and educated people and supportive graduate students and government grants doing all of this. And it's saving thousands of lives, maybe hundreds of thousands of lives, just in this one little area, this little tiny area of weather prediction. It's science and education. It's not philosophy. It's not praying to God. It, it's doing something about it. It's helping God by doing something for ourselves. And yet you have people that want to cut funding in these areas. The, the total NES's budget is about $2.1 billion a year, the satellite budget in the United States. $2.1 billion, sounds like a lot, right? These hurricanes, we've had 15 $1 billion disasters already in nine months of, of this year. And, 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 it's, and, and they want to cut it. We're, we're trying, I'm trying to design the satellite system for 2030 and beyond, and I'll be dead. I still think it's important, even though I'll be dead. Uh, I have children. I probably won't have grandchildren, but many of you have grandchildren. They're going to have children. Uh, and uh, we need to be preparing for the science and the forecast of 2030 and beyond. That's what I'm trying to do. Let's get back to what might be possible. Let's get back to what some fun stuff is. All right, well, this is an interesting thing that uh, is actually fairly old, old technology in the modeling area and visualization compared to some of the things we can do now. But what it is is a five-day forecast using a NASA model, a very high-resolution advanced model of Cyclone Nargis, which is a major storm that came in, uh, uh, developed in the Indian Ocean. And this shows the five-day forecast in this model of uh, the genesis of this storm. And it's kind of an interesting, beautiful, present, beautiful depiction. But these are basically the wind flow at different levels. The, the green, greenish colors are low-level flow, and the reddish cover, colors are the upper-level jets. And so you see uh, kind of low-level flow. You're looking at the Indian Ocean there. And you can see, uh, with time, this vortex develop in the Indian Ocean. And there you can see it. That's the cyclone Nargis. 2008, and you can see this developing with no hint of anything of that scale in the initial conditions. The large scale just did it. There was predictability of that uh, uh, tropical cyclone uh, five days in advance by this uh, the global model um, in the right place and pretty much at the right time, not exactly in the right place or exactly at the right time. And this is becoming or could become a routine. You saw this in Hurricane Sandy, which is a real data case. So there, there's the cyclone well developed. You can see the low level inflow and the outflow global model uh, <clears throat> and initialized with uh, real data. So again, we know what we're doing. Okay, here's a, a climate model for, I say, quote, September 2000, 
which might be September 2500, 50 years from now, for an entire month. And again, does this pass the reality test? Do you see hurricanes forming in the Atlantic and moving toward Florida or toward New Orleans? Does this look realistic? Well, look at that. That looks exactly like Hurricane Katrina. There's more forming in the Atlantic. So these large-scale models, you know, with the right physics, the right ocean interactions can produce uh, hurricanes uh, in the right place and climatologically at least at the right, right seasons. Okay, so I am going to start wrapping this up. Anyway, the summary is from a, getting away from Laplace's abstraction of being able to predict everything all the time at all scales and every human's uh, behavior and all their children's behavior and all that. There is evidence that uh, you can have greatly improved forecasts of such severe weather as tropical cyclones. I hope you remember the prologue that these are really high impact events. Uh, days in advance. And then the, the boring line that you, you but you've got to keep pounding this home to, to the politicians that this is not by accident. We need high resolution models, probably at four kilometers or better. We need improved physics, means understanding. We need more PhD students working on these problems. We need interactive ocean atmosphere models. We need improved initial conditions in the atmosphere, temperature, water vapor, and winds. Satellite observations are absolutely essential here. We need better data assimilation techniques. That's, that's ways of using these strange forms of data uh, from the satellites, and we need faster computers. So again, this is one slice in one aspect of society, but we know how to do it. And we just don't have the will to do it, it seems sometimes. So back to the uh, answer, the big picture. Who wins, the butterfly or the demon, Laplace's demon? Well, there is a difference between what is theoretically possible that's what's called predictability, and what can ever actually be done, and that's actually predictions. The demon may be theoretically possible, and that's a question, I think, uh, for philosophers, um, not for us, because we'll never be there in a practical point of view, but the butterflies are ultimately going to win, uh, and I see there's no reason not to help the demon a little, and uh, in such beneficial activities as weather prediction. and. Uh, uh, that's the uh, the end of my talk. Thank, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions or outrageous statements or challenges or uh, denial or whatever whatever alternative points of view. Thank you.